Jules Verne, the octopus thing I read when I was in third standard. I think that was one of the first books probably when I was in third, fourth standard which freaked me out. I mean, he exaggerated everything. There's no such octopus in the world. He imagined such a big octopus which would come and pull down a whole, uh, you know, like an ocean liner and all that kind of stuff. And I think I was in my third or fourth standard when it so freaked my imagination. This octopus and me wanting to go to the sea and want to see these octopuses and whatever else, all those other things that go with it. I think for almost six months, eight months, this octopus has crawled through my brains. That's one book that really grabbed my imagination. The next big book that grabbed my imagination was uh, Gulliver's Travels. I wanted to go to those islands and meet those little people and kick them around a little bit and you know, just the idea because when you are… Uh, when you are seven, eight, you are a bloody Lilliput in the world, everybody is taller than you and everybody thinks he's adult and everybody… Because I could think like them, I could feel like them but they always thought you are a Lilliput. So I wanted to go to that island and meet these really little ones and kick them around a little bit as they were doing, adults were doing to me <laughs> <laughs> so, Gulliver's Travels really did that. And uh, okay, the other big one, all these going to the sea books somehow fascinated me. Robinson Crusoe just freaked me out. I really wanted to go away when we were in ninth standard, me and my friends planned, we'll build a craft and we'll go off to Tahiti. We wanted to just go away, three, four of us, we want to build a boat and sail away to Tahiti. We study the ocean currents, how to go, which season to take off to the ocean, the works. There's another movie, I don't know, when Captain… There used to be lot of English movies at that time, where kids run off to the ocean, you know, as a… what do you call them? Stowaways. As a stowaway, you go in a ship, all these stories caught my imagination so much, always we were chanting, if you run, you must run to the sea, you must run to the sea. <laughs> we never ran, fortunately. <laughs> we almost ran, but we didn't run. <laughs> Robinson Crusoe and later on, it still fascinated me that island getting lost thing was… Uh, what is this? Ibsen's… Crichton, what is it? Cry Admirable Crichton. So here a whole English family in… in the Victorian age, they go on a ship and they crash and they get lost on an island. So suddenly the whole life gets reversed. These English dandies can't survive on an island, they don't know anything, how to do anything, they can't… they don't know how to strike a matchbox. So slowly this Crichton is a cook, slowly cook, gradually becomes the leader and this… Uh, this aristocrat becomes a buffoon on the island. This Crichton marries one of the daughters because… yeah, because they are there for many years. The whole society gets reversed. The lowest becomes the highest and the highest becomes the lowest because the conditions have changed from England. And after some eight or ten years, one day a ship comes, and uh, they don't know what to do because now the cook has become the boss. Suddenly if the ship comes, everything will get reversed again. <laughs> but Crichton says, this is a natural order of society. There that was the order. Here this is the order. If you go back to England, once again that's the order. So he sets up a smoke signal, ship comes and picks them up and then they come back to England. And once again Crichton becomes a cook. And suddenly the dandy feels so uncomfortable because all these days he was a buffoon, was good for nothing and suddenly he is the boss now. And they all invent stories how they survived on the island and how they did wonderful things and Crichton say… won't say one word for everything, he says, yes sir. He again becomes a butler in their family. So that's admirable Crichton. In high school, one book I read was the… Uh, Jonathan Livingstone Seagull. Have you read that? Richard Bach? 
In about a month, I read about twenty-three times this book. It really freaked me. I read Illusions also many times. Khalil Gibran's, what, uh, prophet really struck a chord in me. More than that, uh, Mikhail Hemi's The Book of Mirdad, oh, that was wonderful. These all, I read them when I was, you know, somewhere between twenty to twenty-four, which all piled up in me in a big way, one on top of the other. Mabi Dick really freaked me. That, that's a book that still rules my mind one way or the other. That's about a whale. Again, see, I don't know why. And Tolstoy was really, it affected me quite a lot. Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, uh, that made a big, big impact on me. Have you read why? Yeah, yeah. I read almost all the books of Tolstoy. So they were all Russian books and available at two rupees, three rupees. I bought up a whole library of Russian books and read them up. What way books transcend everything? They don't transcend. It is just that uh, if the author is uh, very insightful, to live life as everybody lives, it would take a thousand years for you. But in those two days when you read a five hundred page book, which goes into somebody's life intricately, uh, you actually live through that without actually having to go through all that. <laughs>